Good evening. My name is Mary Jane Boland and I'm delighted to be your host for this evening's webinar about the new Cambridge Children's Hospital and its exciting School Without Walls program. I'm the Director of Development for Cambridge University Health Partners. As you can tell from my accent, I'm a New Zealander having recently arrived to take up this role at the University of Cambridge. Before we start, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping matters. Ordinarily, if we were in person, this would involve pointing out the nearest fire exit, but given that you are hopefully in a comfortable chair at your home or in your office, you will hopefully already have a sense of the closest exit should you smell fire. Given that this is a webinar, it should be noted that we are recording this so that others can watch it at another time. The webinar format today means you can see our speakers and me as host, but we can't see you. So you are welcome to sit and watch this in your dressing gown without fear of being spotted on screen. We'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations. So please put your questions in the chat function on the bottom of your screen, and we will endeavor to answer as many of these as possible. Right, on to more important business than housekeeping. Many of you here this evening will be living in East Anglia, and it is perhaps surprising to some of you that the east of England with 1.5 million children and young people is the only region in the UK without a dedicated children's hospital. The good news is that we have wonderful plans to build the Cambridge Children's Hospital. This purpose-built facility is expected to open within the next five years and there are two amazing aspects to this which should be of significant interest to both local people but also people around the world. Firstly, Cambridge Children's Hospital will have a unique approach to integrating mental and physical health care. And secondly, this will be underpinned by world leading research in genomic medicine and mind body science. Given that this week is Children's Mental Health Awareness Week, it seems very appropriate that our two guest speakers this evening are focused on the integration of mind and body health. For those of you unfamiliar with Cambridge Children's Hospital, which will be completed with a combination of government and philanthropic funding, this is a unique collaboration between Cambridge University Hospitals, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust, and the University of Cambridge to create a state-of-the-art new children's hospital. We're calling this approach a whole new way. So what does that actually mean? The whole child, we plan to bring physical and mental expertise from all disciplines together under one roof, working in unison to organize treatment which supports everything a child may be going through, whether that's visible or not. Then there's the whole life. Embedded within the new Cambridge Children's Hospital will be a state-of-the-art research institute dedicated to understanding the early origins of disease which affect both physical and mental health. There's the whole community, Cambridge Children's Hospital will leverage telehealth, technology and telemedicine to go far beyond its walls. And we will provide care closer to home to keep children out of hospital whenever possible. Finally, there's the whole picture. We're taking a holistic approach to understanding the person, not just the patient. We'll look beyond what is written on their chart and understand what's important to every child we meet, outdoor space, play and school. This evening's webinar will focus on school and its place at Cambridge Children's Hospital. We all know how important school is to children and young people, and that includes when they're also in hospital. We know that missing school because of hospitalisation increases emotional difficulties like anxiety and depression, and those with childhood illness often need extra help in school. Our wonderful new hospital will have its own School Without Walls programme which goes beyond what one expects from a traditional school. At Cambridge Children's Hospital, children and young people will learn at their bedsides or in classrooms, either on a ward or shared with other children from other wards and using outdoor spaces as well. That's probably more than enough talking from me. We're delighted tonight to welcome Professor Tamsin Ford and Dr. Isabel Heyman as our guest speakers. Tamsin is a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, and Isabel recently joined the Cambridge Children's Hospital team as a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist at Addenbrooke's Hospital Pediatric Psychological Medicine Service. Tamsin's academic work focuses on the effectiveness of interventions and the efficiency of services in relation to the mental health of children and young people. 
She has a particular focus on the interface between education and health systems. And she completed her PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry and moved to Exeter in 2007, where she set up the Child Mental Health Research Group. Tamsin moved to Cambridge in 2019. Isabel, our second speaker, is an honorary professor at the Institute of Child Health, University College of London, and a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist at Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. Isabel studied medicine at UCL in London and completed a PhD in developmental neurobiology at King, King's College London. She, like Tamsin, has a long history of working as a consultant psychiatrist and Isabel's particular interests are the emotional and behavioral problems that affect children who also have long-term physical health problems. She is involved in research specifically relating to developmental neuropsychiatry, epilepsy, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Tourette syndrome. Isabel was awarded the Royal College of Psychiatrists Psychiatrist of the Year Award in 2015. Tamsin and Isabel look forward to sharing more about this pioneering approach to mental health and school at the New Cambridge Children's Hospital. I'll now hand over to Tamsin to tell us more about her research and the importance of school for mental health. Thank you and welcome, Tamsin. Thank you very much. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And I, I yeah, it, it now hopefully is sharing properly for you. So I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist and thanks to COVID, um, I now no longer have to explain the epidemiology of it or, or what epidemiology means. Um, it's the basic science that underpins public health and for somebody with an interest in how we can make services better to support children, young people and their families to optimise their development, it is the obvious um, basis for a research program. So I'm going to talk a bit about findings from official government statistics, about population level mental health and the interface between um, school and mental health and how they are really important, and then the implications for that for the children's hospital. So dating back um, to my PhD many years ago at the Institute of Psychiatry, I demonstrated that actually schools are a de facto mental health service. And we have repeatedly shown that teachers are the most um, commonly approached mental health service, whilst a, a rather small proportion of children who have a mental health condition, and you can see the percentages from our last big national survey in 2017, you can see that only a quarter of those had had contact with a mental health service, but nearly half there had been some mental health related contact with, um, with teachers. And this is because, as you were well known from your own experience, it's very difficult to function well at work or doing tasks that require sustained concentration when you are distressed or highly stressed about something, and it's no different for children. So children with poor mental health are more likely to have lower attainment when it comes to school, to do less well with their educational outcomes. And we know that there is this big overlap between um, having poor mental health and having poor physical health. If you have poor physical health, you are at least um, one and a half, if not twice as likely to have a physical health condition of, of some kind. And we know that um, mental health conditions impact um, people's physical health. The most obvious example of that is with eating disorders, but actually severe and enduring mental health um, reduces your life expectancy. Um, so the challenge then for the hospital school is to help children access education as far as they can. Um, and teachers are hugely, hugely important to children's mental health. So that integration, and you know, we've talked about the whole picture, the whole child, 
um, in the introduction, that integration between school and health support, between um, the community and the hospital is intrinsic to the vision of Cambridge Children's Hospital. So just to really ram home the point about how um, the mental health of a child impacts their education and vice versa, this is from the 2017 National Survey, which generates the government's official statistics on which they base services. And what you can see there is um, with the red circle around um, the grey bar, which is the proportion of children with any kind of a mental health condition who also were recognised to have special educational needs, it's, about, it's more than a third of them. And it's particularly common for children with ADHD or the other disorder will mainly be autism spectrum, but there are also eating disorders and tick disorders and other rarer difficulties in there. But actually, even with the emotional um, problems of anxiety and depression, they less commonly impact school, but they still do in a large number of children. And of course, the flip side, this is cross-sectional data where the mental health condition was assessed at the same time as the report about special educational needs. And there, are, there will be some children for whom the struggling at school and finding school difficult to access the curriculum came first with the mental health problem developing as a result of that. And there will be others for whom the mental health problems, such as an autism spectrum condition, which makes it difficult to deal with change, which makes it difficult to deal with the highly social environment that a school presents, particularly at secondary level. Um, so the mental health need comes first. Um, and often these children can be very um, academically able, but actually they need support to cope with the unstructured times like sports and, and lunch times. And just to stress how important teachers are, there was a very seminal study of girls growing up in care. And the two things that predicted a good outcome was one interested adult, and that was often a teacher, and who their partner was. So when school goes really badly wrong for children, it can end up in exclusion. And by that, I mean either permanent exclusion or being expelled in, in old language, or a, a fixed term exclusion, um, which in my day we used to describe as being suspended. And there is a bi-directional relationship, as I've just hinted at, between having poor mental health and subsequently being excluded. And what you are looking at is mental health measured in 2004, predicting to exclusion from school three years later, despite adjusting for all those background figures. So children for whom um, the parents and teachers were worried about their mental health actually were more likely, four times as likely to have been excluded in the next three years. So this isn't a failure of recognition. We need to be better at supporting these children. Exclusion is the school saying, you know, is a disciplinary tool and often um, can come at the end of a school struggling to cope and in the qualitative work where we talk to parents of children who've been excluded and we talk to um, the teachers and teaching assistants working with them, we heard lots of stories about struggling to access support both within school and outside school of referrals made and long, long waiting lists both for assessment and then for treatment. Um, so, as I say, not a failure of recognition. And there will be some children for whom an ordinary mainstream school, even with support, is not appropriate. But I would argue that we should be making that transition to special school or alternative provision to support the child. Um, and that we should try to avoid excluding children with special educational needs because I, I think it often reps represents a failure of the system that is then felt by the child and their family. But there's also a very strong association between anxiety and depression and also self-harm and attendance at school. Now, when I started training, and interestingly, Isabel and I were both um, trainees, post-qualification post trainees, 
um, as junior doctors together in the same place, we, we were taught that um, emotional problems such as anxiety and depression led to something called school refusal. When the child didn't go to school, the parents either couldn't get them to go or sanctioned them not going to school. Um, whereas behaviour problems were associated with truancy. In fact, my research shows it's much, much more complicated than this. And again, for individual children, there is a, a relationship that goes both ways. If you're not in school, you don't have a structure to your day. And quite often your sleep structure and eating structure goes out of the window. That's not good for how you feel in terms of your mood and your energy and your ability to concentrate. That makes going into school harder. Um, likewise, if school is a socially frightening place or, or you are an anxious person and find it difficult to stay within the school environment or you're being bullied, staying out of school will drop your anxiety levels. Anxiety is really sneaky like that. It's a um, fight, flight, freeze response to a stress that um, is evolutionary about getting you out of danger. The trouble is that you feel better out of school in the short term, it's then harder to get back into school. And I think there is quite an issue with children with the disruptions that we've had with school closures have been really struggling to get back into school sometimes. There is overlap between the difficulties that can emerge as part of the emotional disorder. Both anxiety and depression can make it hard to concentrate, can make disrupt sleep so you're tired. Um, if you are feeling depressed, you're likely to withdraw socially and then the lack of social um, interaction can leave you feeling low and likewise with anxiety. And both anxiety can um, lead to um, symptoms in the body, which um, Isabel will talk about more. So there is this complex relationship. And for those of you who are interested, I, with um, colleagues in Exeter, have edited a book on this interface, which is available um, shortly. The other thing we shouldn't forget is teachers. As I've said, the relationships between teachers and pure pupils are really important and really powerful. But teaching is a really stressful job. And work that we have done suggests that actually teachers in both primary schools, so the two graphs on the left are teachers in a trial that I'm, I ran, an experiment in schools that um, I ran in the West Country, and these were primary school teachers showing that they are scoring much higher on the everyday feeling questionnaire, which measures anxiety and depression, so sort of psychological distress. They're scoring much higher than um, professional parents in the national survey. And likewise, the WISE study was another trial, another experiment in secondary schools around Bristol. And there we found much higher rates of moderate to severe depression on a questionnaire called the PHQ or the, the um, Personal Health Questionnaire than the US population. Now we couldn't find a UK comparison, but I don't think America is that different to the UK in terms of, of these kind of values. And in fact, 10% of the primary school teachers in our STARS trial, and we collected data at baseline nine months later, and then in the next um, two academic years. So over 30 months, 10% of the teachers who were well enough to be at work were scoring in the moderate to severe depression range on, on our measure of depression. Now, the implications of that are profound because if you are depressed and anxious, it's you're likely to be more irritable, you are likely to be more reactive. Um, there's a wonderful um, paper by Tish Jennings, who um, was at Penn State University at the time she wrote it with Mark Greenberg, talking about the burnout cascade and how the mental health of teachers can get them into a situation in the classroom where they are irritable, reactive, the children get more unsettled, they get more stressed, they feel that they're not doing their job well, and you can get into a, a very vicious circle. So having put all that together, that you know, mental health conditions in children are very common. In fact, our most recent data suggests 
last year and this year that one in six school age children between six and 16 um, would meet diagnostic criteria for a mental health condition. So that's potentially five or six in every classroom. Mental health conditions are common and they're persistent and they get in the way of education. And so um, supporting schools to support children and young people is, is an essential part of being able to teach. It's not additional business, it's part of core business. So I ran an experiment because we need to be sure that something that sounds like a good idea actually is a good idea in, in practice, where we randomized, so like flipping a coin, one teacher from 80 schools, from each of 80 schools, so 40 teachers went on a training um, program and 40 teachers um, went, carried on teaching as useful, as usual. And so the idea of this program is, it's not teaching teachers completely new skills, it's about honing their knowledge and shifting slightly how they do things. It's also, although it is often described as using positive techniques, those, it's not sort of just being nice and fluffy. It's about having very clear rules and clear limits, but being very specific with the children about what you want them to do, not the kind of don't do that, don't do that, stop talking, stop fiddling. It's like, I want you to sit down and listen. And then rather than picking up on the child who's not listening, it's picking up on the child who is doing what, what you want. So Mary Jane, you are really paying attention nicely today. And that makes the rest of the class think, oh, you know, they notice Mary Jane because she's working hard and I want to be um, like Mary Jane. So we ran this um, experiment. And as I said, we got data before the, ch the children and their teachers were randomized to either have the teacher trained or not. We went back at the end of the same year where the, that teacher was in the classroom with the children still. And then we ensured that the teacher and the children separated and we got data from two further um, in two subsequent years. And this is what we found. This is what teachers said. I think one thing I grasped is the idea that we are important teachers and how much we do mean to the children and how we can actually make a difference. It changed me and I think my relationship towards the children, I take far more interest in them as individuals and far more interest in their personal lives as well. My whole mindset has changed. Everything I've learned at uni, it's not going out the window, but I think my mindset and my practice and the way I deliver my lessons and my behaviour management has completely changed because of the things we've discussed, the way I've learned from others here. And Ed Sykes said, there's no way I would have said you're an NQT watching your behaviour management. It definitely has more impact and it leads to, you know, um, a happier classroom. The kids have confidences up, they're more willing to do things and try really hard. Because if they know they're doing what you've asked them to do, they're going to get the praise, they're going to get the rewards. For those of you wondering, NQT means newly qualified teacher. So someone who's literally a, a, a within their first year. So what does all this background mean for the school that we're planning? Well, um, as our families and children working with us have made very, very clear, school is integral to the recovery place. What they are saying is we don't want teaching by the bed. You know, we want as much normality as we can. We want to get up and go to a classroom and we want help to keep up. So if you have a head injury, for example, or you have cancer as a child, you may be in and out of hospital for months. And some days, yes, you may be feeling too unwell to work, but there will be other days when you can do things. The having a school with a classroom and activities means that there is structure to the day and it feels a bit more normal. And the integration back into school and finding out where a, a young person was and, and getting work in and helping them keep contact with their peers is a really, really important part. You can imagine just how anxious people, both the teachers and the parents and the young person might be going back into a busy school environment, say after a really nasty, head injury or having had operation for cancer and actually managing that and 
letting the child and the family know what to expect and supporting the staff so that they understand what to expect is a really, really integral part of, of this whole child, whole um, picture approach. So we want to go beyond the typical school, um, which at the moment, the Mental Health um, Trust has excellent provision. And in fact, the, the young people who are admitted and you know it's a small proportion of the child mental health work the trust does they often come in struggling behind where they should be and they are often caught up by the time that they go up go out and sadly admissions for mental health conditions are, are often measured in weeks or, or maybe months so it's really important i think the provision in um, the current addenbrookes is much less available. And this is why having these two classrooms that will integrate mental health and um, general hospital admissions and allow people not to be sitting by their bed in isolation, but have a bit more of a normal structure, even if they can only go for part of the day. It will cater for the range of years, from early years to sixth form, and we'll be aiming to support children of, and young people of all abilities. The idea will be to work in small groups and to reach out into the community, both in terms of, of keeping links with peers and with other activities and, and bringing work in, but also in supporting that return. Um, and, you know, obviously there is a role for technology um, in this. And we, you know, one of the things that predicts the persistence of mental health conditions is peer relationship difficulties. So we shouldn't un underestimate how important getting that transition um, back into school is for keeping children out of hospital. And that is what we want to do. We want to minimize the time that children are away from their homes and their families. So we recognise schooling is a normal part of the um, child's life and there is a lot of thought going into the school space. Important to have access to outdoor space for learning and for play, um, both for the school but also for relaxation. And to be able to share this um, space for teaching and for therapies. Um, you know, you can incorporate physiotherapy into PE, for example. Um, you can incorporate occupational therapy into activities that also promote other kinds of, of learning. Obviously, um, we have some wonderful staff already um, and, you know, the staff will be trained in health and be accessible to the patients to help with structuring days and support and continuing education as far as possible. And as I keep stressing, the transition back from hospital into to, um, the child's ordinary school or an appropriate placement is so important to their ongoing health and development. So I will stop there and I will hand over to Isabel. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here um, this evening. And I'm going to turn now to a clinical topic, which I think will in many ways be familiar to everybody in the room, because I'm going to talk about what happens when your mind and body play tricks on you and you actually experience physical symptoms which have a huge impact on how you get on with your life. And of course, for children, one of the biggest impacts is on their ability to attend school if they have symptoms or problems. And the reason I'm a psychiatrist talking about this is that the group of children I'm particularly going to be talking about are those with what we call medically unexplained symptoms or functional symptoms. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that particularly impacts on education. And I'm going to share my screen. Oops. So I hope everybody can see. And I'm actually going to start by showing you a short video clip. 
This is a little boy who um, was about 11 or just maybe 10 and a half at the time, who had functional neurological disorder. And um, he came for treatment in my previous uh, place of work, Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this video, the family kindly made it actually for a conference last year during lockdown with several other families. And I think he and his parents can tell you better than I can what it's like to have medically unexplained symptoms. Oscar was a happy nine-year-old boy um, who once called me Dr. Floor, and he was having to My symptoms were dropping to the floor when I was sitting and standing, and it hurt a lot. But whenever I was on the floor, I couldn't move, I couldn't see, I, I definitely couldn't get up. All I could do was just hear and breathe, and I just didn't like it, like because all I heard was just commotion around me. It scared me, and that was one of the reasons why I didn't go out a lot. I was worried because nobody, no medical professional, would tell me what was wrong with him. Um, he was dropping to the floor up to hundred times a day. He was unresponsive, although he was breathing. His eyes were closed. And he, he just can't respond to you. So our worry was what was going on. Lots of adults thought I was faking it, and lots of people at the hospital thought I was faking it. But my parents didn't, they believed me. He was taken to our local hospital um, where he was prescribed EPI. Um, he had an ECG and EEG, he had a CT scan, and he had an MRI scan. I went to a lot of local hospitals who gave me no one's wrong with me, it was quite scary. What was the hardest thing for you about having functional symptoms? Um, probably going to school because um, the doctor at my local hospital wouldn't let me go to school, and also probably going out to hear other people staring at me. Challenges have all been based from the outset around school. Um, school supporting or recognising his diagnosis. Um, not putting in place these recommendations and suggestions from medical professionals. I had treatment with my psychologist Maria. I went to some functional groups. Although people had different symptoms, um, I just didn't feel alone and it really helped me a lot. The thing that surprised me about my, my recovery is that um, working with Maria, it took me no time to go back to school, but I had to work very hard though. And now back to school, I can go out on that. Everything is back to the world where I had the drops. And if I do get really anxious and I have the occasional drops, that's okay. I learned that my drops are the uh, linked to my anxiety about school and my church. I wish I'd known the extent of Oscar's anxiety and I wish I'd known that he had learning needs. He had been expressing difficulty in understanding English. Um, I wasn't aware of this, his teacher wasn't aware of this, so he would easily um, explain this to a psychologist. So she decided that she would do some in-depth cognitive tests to see whether there was a, a problem. Um, and the results identified that Oscar had um, extremely slow processing speed. The main thing we learned was that he was extremely anxious. Um, a few months prior to his drop starting, he'd been diagnosed with stress syndrome. And it was this threat syndrome that was causing his anxiety that was causing him to drop. So, um, I think you couldn't really have had a clearer example of how we can't separate out mind and body when we look after children and, and adults. And I think that's why the new Cambridge Children's Hospital is so incredibly exciting. And that as far as I'm aware, it's the first hospital ever to have had as its key mission integrating physical and mental health, because I think what you'll have heard in that description from um, Oscar and his mom is that absolutely key to his recovery was linking mental health and physical health in his care. Otherwise, he would have just got stuck in a cycle of having more and more tests, investigations, people not understanding what was wrong. And his recovery actually came from psychological treatment and for managing his anxiety and dealing with his learning 
problems. So in the few slides I'm going to show you now, I'm just going to pick up on some of those themes and really think about how in the New Children's Hospital, this is the type of child and the type of service that we really want to demonstrate gold standard care for. So functional symptoms have got lots of names, which doesn't help the confusion in the field, sometimes medically unexplained, persistent physical symptoms. And it's important that in the main, they are occurring in people who don't have a serious disease of any sort, but there are also people who do have a disease, but yet their impairment or their disability is disproportionate. So it's another example of actually where almost anybody with ill health can benefit at times from psychological insight or psychologically informed care. So one person with a broken leg will be up and walking in a day or two because they're resilient, they don't experience so much pain, whereas another person, because of their temperament or their makeup or their reaction, may find that much more of a challenge and may need some psychological support to be able to, to deal with that circumstance in their life. Um, and we, of course, like everything else, we classify this um, in mental health under somatic symptom and related disorders. So I think you picked up on this from Oscar's mother. When a child has got symptoms and nobody can find out what the cause is, everybody gets extremely worried. They get very anxious for their child and often um, stop them doing things. And actually you heard in the, in the talk that um, the doctors got very worried and suggested that Oscar shouldn't go to school. People feel quite helpless, they don't know where to go, what to do next, and actually often get quite angry and, and defensive. And of course, this then spreads into their relationships with professionals, and health professionals are often very ill-informed about this group of patients and, and feel de-skilled themselves. I've had many doctors, paediatricians say to me, I just don't know what to do, there's nothing wrong with him, because there is something wrong, they've got genuine symptoms, but if patient and doctor begin to miscommunicate in that sort of way, parents then seek yet another opinion, the child gets taken to another round of appointments, everybody gets more distressed, nothing is found, and nobody knows how to explain this illness uh, to other people. So what this needs is really careful exploration and questioning. And again, this is why mental health professionals are so important to have as part of the multidisciplinary team, because you do have to be very curious. And what studies have shown is that actually, if you talk carefully to children and families presenting with unexplained uh, symptoms, there is often something that has gone on that is a stress or a trigger. It can be something extremely severe, like sexual abuse or severe abuse, but it more usually is something much more minor, like in Oscar's case, quite long-standing anxiety, some difficulties in schoolwork, or it can be a family event, it can be bullying. So really, really important to have a team that will dig around, talk, gain confidence and find out what's going on so that can be um, mitigated. Also, this is not a small problem. And this is where it's, again, such a privilege at Cambridge Children's to be able to work with researchers, because although there has been good epidemiology and population studies done in adults with functional symptoms, we really don't know the scale of the problem in, in children. So this is going to be something I'm going to hand to Tamsin and her team to be researching in the next few years. But in adults, these are extraordinary figures, something like two thirds of women attending gynaecology patients often have no established underlying cause for their symptoms and quite similar in neurology. And when we did look in specialist neurology clinics, we actually found that in children presenting with epilepsy, 
up to 40% had non-epileptic seizures, some of those as well as epileptic seizures, but about 25% without any epilepsy at all. So this is a problem that is really common in our hospitals. And surprisingly, perhaps, you actually end up going to the doctor more if you have medically unexplained symptoms because you get into this kind of cycle that I described a bit before. You might go to your GP who might be perplexed, refer you on to a secondary um, doctor, sorry, um, where you might have some more tests and then get referred on to another specialist. And this cycle can go round and round. So, all of these visits to doctors, the impact of the symptoms themselves, and you know the persistence of this if it's not treated, not only is distressing and disruptive to children, but um, the costs, we know again in adults more than in children, are um, a lot in financial terms as well as in um, health and social and educational terms. Now, I'm just going to show, I, I'm not going to show um, uh, as much research at all as Tamsin did, but this is a slide that is important because there are specific treatments that work for children with functional symptoms. So that's why having a properly designed, properly funded, properly evaluated functional symptom service is key. And this is just the result of what we call a meta-analysis where Charlotte Rask and her group from Denmark pulled together all the studies, which aren't very many, um, a few years old, that have been done. And what this shows, the black triangle sitting on this side, shows that the positive evidence compared with controls was for psychological treatment and in particular cognitive behaviour therapy. So this gives us a guideline of where we should be starting when we think about designing new services in the new children's hospital, we need a multidisciplinary uh, team and we need to make sure that this type of treatment is available. And this is the sort of scheme for incorporating cognitive behaviour therapy. It's not the only element. There's lots of information and education needed to help people understand functional symptoms. And of course, managing the symptoms themselves, they are real. They're not made up or put on. And so, you know, schools, for example, will frequently call ambulances, which isn't necessary. Identifying stresses and dealing with those, as we talked about, and really importantly, identifying and treating any additional mental health needs, for example, anxiety, depression, but also neurodevelopmental problems like ADHD, identifying and supporting autism spectrum disorders. So management is not only integrated between physical and mental health, between mind and body, but it's integrated across tiers. So the children and their families are at our core, but we need to talk to the schools because that's where children spend so much of their time and schools need to be supported and helped in, in managing children who are suddenly collapsing, for example, for no reason. And we have to then add on our structured assessment and um, specialist treatment. So this, it's, I, it's such a shame we're not all together um, in a room, and I, I, I hate not being able to see everybody. But there are 60 or so of us on this uh, webinar, which is very exciting. But this would be a quiz that I would normally get you all to, to put your hands up. But all of these symptoms or signs, I would be asking you, are they physical or are they psychological? Is it your mind or is it your body? And you'll all have a view on this. But I think you also will all know that, of course, they're all both. So even something that is as tangible as a horrible, painful ulcer in your mouth, we all know that those arise um, at times of stress and distress. So this shows how powerful the mind-body link is. Similarly, you know, which amongst us has not got a headache before a stressful you know, presentation or uh, a tummy ache or needing to rush to the loo. So I think 
I'm showing you these slides because this is actually the type of group uh, session we run as a game often with children and parents when we're beginning to help them understand this mind and body link. Because often they're very worried and very resistant at the beginning and it's hard to believe that a stressed brain can make your body do something that looks exactly like an epileptic seizure. So that's the first step in treatment, learning about the mind-body link, really ensuring that you've got the right multidisciplinary team, which I'm really confident, um, you know, is the aim to build at Cambridge Children's. Identifying those stressors, as I showed you in the flow, in the flow chart, and predicting the symptoms, I've got non-epileptic seizures here as an example, and managing the patterns of behavior that get set up in relation to symptoms and detecting and treating other problems. And of course, I could do a whole talk on the, that treatment, but that's for another day. So just, um, just some examples of, of the detail. So, you know, very often a simple intervention that makes can turn things around actually is additional support for the child in something that is just a chronic but significant stress to them if they're falling behind with their schoolwork if they're not understanding something if they have got an undetected learning need i've had several children identified um, late with dyslexia, which hadn't been spotted, and actually, you know, their, their symptoms were in relation to that stress, and with time, as they got support with literacy, they improved. Really key, um, and again, it's counterintuitive, which is why, you know, it needs a lot of support for families to do that, this, is reducing attention to symptoms, to not discuss them, not to spend much time over them, but to gradually help them become less dominant. Really importantly, to stop doctor shopping, not a very nice term, but to stop seeking more and more medical advice once the definite diagnosis has been made and to engage with mental health uh, care and to ensure that the mental health team and the, and the physical health team work closely together. And that is always a challenge. And again, I just think it is so exciting that Cambridge Children's is setting up from the beginning for this to be um, an expectation, really. Work, working with schools is extremely important. Um, I think Oscar's mother was a bit tough on, on, on his school, saying um, you know, they didn't implement the um, recommendations, but I think it's the onus is on health professionals to actually go into school and be supportive, be educational, help teachers know exactly um, what to do. So my final slide, um, I hope I've been able to persuade you, I'm sure you didn't need persuading, that, that mind and body really cannot be separated when we help children that functional symptom disorders are much more common than we think. I mean, I, I meant to say this at the beginning actually, but you know, there won't be anybody here who hasn't had a child who said, you know, I won't go to school mummy because um, I've uh, got tummy ache. And you know, these aren't the severe cases I've been talking about today, but when a child develops three, four, five, six symptoms like that, or becomes overwhelmed or unable to walk, then it becomes at a level where their life is severely affected. And I think I've, I've told you the impact that functional symptoms can have, that excessive investigations um, do, do harm, that expert and bespoke services are needed, and that Cambridge Children's is ideally positioned to lead um, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isabel and Tamsin, and I hope you all enjoyed that immensely. Um, with regard to questions, do feel free to pop any further questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screens. And I am going to attempt to facilitate some question and answer sessions now and do my very best if I can. 
Um, there's an interesting question that's come in about the role of, of the arts and both um, music and visual arts, Tams, and I'm going to put you on the spot with that shortly. But I think it might be worth just, just for people listening and watching that, that we do have a very significant art strategy with the new Children's Hospital. Um, and I know that Isabel and Tamsin are very familiar with the importance of, of this aspect of it. So Tamsin, can I throw that question mm. to you about, about the importance of arts and music in the school, but also in the hospital itself? Well, I think, um, you know, it's come through loud and clear with the children and um, young people and parents who've been co-designing with us. So working alongside children and families to um, design a hospital that works for them has been a central theme within this program. And they have all been very clear that they wanted an environment that was not stark and highly clinical, but that felt homely with access to outside space. Um, and you know your environment affects your well-being it, we all know that from our own experience um and i think um you know there is a form of working with people um to express things um you know which they perhaps find difficult to say using art some people it's music so you know i think all these activities are incredibly important to people's development, not just children and not just children in hospital. Great, thanks so much, Tamsin. Um, the other question which has come in, which I think is very interesting too, is about the interface between Cambridge Children's Hospital and how it will share its learnings with other educational and health professionals. Um, Isabel, I think this is obviously something that, that for you is, is obviously significantly important in your role. Um, would you mind answering that, please? Yes, and no, it's a really important question because I think clearly any specialist centre can't necessarily absorb all the need in, in, in its catchment area and in the region. And I think absolutely key to Cambridge Children's is its outreach and a sort of what's sometimes called a bit jargon, a jargony hub and spoke model where I think the expectation that will be that every single specialist will have links both with colleagues in community clinics at all levels of care and other professional groups as, as well. And I think the same applies to you know, the expertise from the school where often hospital school teachers are incredibly skilled at managing children with both physical and mental health needs and more confident than teachers in ordinary um, community schools. So I think a role of that expertise being disseminated. So there's a huge um, education, teaching and training arm to the um, planning for the Children's Hospital, which is precisely about ensuring that it isn't siloed. And I've heard the term, you know, hospital without walls used several times, which is the idea that, you know, you don't come in and are shut off and similarly when you're in you're shut out i think the idea that there's to and fro and communication and, and collaborative learning is crucial i don't know if tamsin wants to add anything else i i think you know yeah just to reiterate how seriously we would take um the training and capacity development um both um within the school side and, and within the health side and also just to say that, you know, there is research data that shows that research active hospitals and clinics have better outcomes, even if you look at people who aren't taking active part in the research. And I think it's something about having what I've heard described as a learning environment, is having a place where it's, you know, having a culture where it's okay to be curious. In fact, it's actively encouraged. And therefore that gets everybody to strive that little bit harder to try and get, get the best outcome for children and families. Um, Thames, and just staying with you too now, just to keep you on the spot as it were. So um, you talked a lot earlier in your, in your presentation about the importance of teachers in this. And, and I think, you know, one of the questions that's come through is about, you know, will these be people who are directly employed by the hospital? Um, you know, what's, what's their role in the, the interface between the teachers and clinicians? And really, I mean, is it, is it 
Is it going to be hospital school staff or are these external teachers that come in? What, what will happen in, in this lovely school without walls? Well, there, there are hospital school staff, <coughs> excuse me, um, already. Um, but if we are doing and providing more, te more teaching for more children, which is the aim, we will need to recruit some. And I guess going back to the last question about training and capacity building and disseminating learning, you know, there are perhaps exciting possibilities further down the line for um, people working in mainstream who want to get experience to come and do placements or to observe the hospital school. Um, but as with everything, um, what looks simple on the face of it, let's have a couple of classrooms and, and let's really integrate the education for all the children in the hospital is quite complex in the delivery. So it's actually funded um, all the staff would be funded by the local education authority the, 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 the same way that ordinary schools are, but they would be working within in the hospital and our current staff would be expanded to meet the increased demand or the increased provision that we want to um, provide. Thank you so much, Thames. And I think we have room and time just for one more question. Um, Isabel, just in terms of, you know, it was very interesting watching the video about Oscar and I guess the commentary around, you know, that, that, that teachers perhaps felt that he was faking it, for example. And, you know, clearly a lot of these children have highly specialised needs. Um, you know, will the, will the hospital and, and will the sort of school, you know, how will it address those highly specific needs for children like Oscar? And, and what, what can we learn from that process in terms of, of is it going to be like a normal classroom or is it going to be something quite different? So I, I think, well, I think every child is, is different. And so I'm gonna answer the question sort of two, um, you know, different, different from two different ways because I think the curriculum and the setting and the responses of course need to be individualized to the needs of that child as best they can be. But I would come back to Tamsin's point about also trying to normalize. And I think, you know, so crucial to, to children's development is, you know, as much as they can, helping them to fit into environments that they need to be able to, to face and to, to explore. So, you know, I think one of the things for children with unusual symptoms, for example, like, like Oscar, is that they, they face teachers with the, the challenge of not having come across them before. And so a lot of it is about education and information. And I think that's the same for a huge range of conditions that within the hospital school, um, you know, they may be very familiar with. And so in fact, they almost don't feature very much. But of course, there will be children with particular disabilities, with particular learning needs, with particular behavioural support needs, and all of those need to be catered for. But that's true in the community as well, within specialist schools and within mainstream schools. So again, I'm not sure if Tamsin agrees, but in fact, she might have frozen, I think. Oh, no. But, um, but I, I see, you know, the hospital school in many ways being as near as possible to a, a school outside a, a hospital, but just an exemplar really of how you can uh, cater to children with a wide range of needs as long as you've got the, su the support and the expertise. I would completely agree. There's nothing I would add to that. Well, I think we're nearly up for time. And I just wanted to, to finish by saying thank you on behalf of Isabel and Tamsin and myself for your attention and your interest in tonight's webinar. Um, I'm sure you'll agree after listening to their presentations how important the Cambridge Children's Hospital is and what an extraordinarily exciting opportunity it is to transform the health and well-being of today's children like Oscar, who is obviously in our video, but also for future generations. Any one of us who has had family or friends who have undergone mental health challenges knows this is a really important hospital and how important its research institute will be within it. It will be a unique facility in the world, but its work will have a global impact. If you'd like to know more, there are some details on the slide. And as mentioned, the project will require a mix of government and philanthropic support. So if you or someone else you know is interested in learning more, 
or connecting us to people who may be keen to support the hospital in a significant way, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, finally, on behalf of Isabel and Tamsin, thank you again for your support and your interest. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good evening. <laughs>